if you're just looking for bang for your buck, just your wrist curls. Now, I will say, because I'm a, I'm a bit braver in my convictions now, I don't think the overhead press is a necessary lift. In this way, I think I'm quite similar to what Mena Hensman uh, recommends as well. And um, his idea being, you don't want to go hungry, you just want to change the food options. Okay, so I want to kick things off by talking about your versatility. As someone who's competed in bodybuilding, strongman, and powerlifting, the thing that I find most interesting is your experience competing in grip contests. So what are intermediate lifters getting wrong with grip training and also forearm development? Yeah, that was the, the wonderful world of grip. For a period of about three years, uh, between 2001 and 2004, roughly, I did these grip competitions, which were run by a guy called David Horn, who um, works out of uh, Stoke. So he's, a, he's an arm wrestler, or at least he used to be. And he takes a real interest in old time strongman stuff, which has an arm of that with, um, with grip training. So yeah, the, the training for that was, was quite interesting. You, there's different asset, different facets of grip training. Um, people just think of grip as either crushing strength or holding strength. There's all types. There's, there is crushing, there's holding, there's also pinching strength as well and, um, finger strength. So there are generally like four broad categories. Um, so if you want to really specialize in that area, you can really nerd out on this stuff and you can do the finger training. So I was doing things like, um, hanging literally deadlifts bars off these straps we put on my fingers. So I think at my peak, I did something like 100, 140 kilos with just sort of the, the middle finger or the pinky finger or whatever. It's quite dangerous stuff because if you rip a tendon there, it's, it's, not, uh, it's not easy to recover. But that was pretty fun. Pinching strength was good and, yeah, grip training. But I think for the, for the regular person who's looked to build forearms, I don't think a lot of that is that applicable, to be honest. I think that's a, a much more specialized form of training for competition. So when people ask me, what should I do for grip? And generally they have an idea of doing, say, farmer's walk or um, holds or things like that. I'm not a big fan of that type of stuff from a bodybuilding perspective. I think from, if you're just looking for bang for your buck, just your wrist curls, behind the back, in front, single arm with a dumbbell are pretty good. Um, and also reverse wrist curls, as well as hammer curl type movements are probably what's going to deliver the biggest bang for your buck. I, I tend to think the grip training stuff is, it's more akin to strongman for your whole body. Like it's going to grow you. You know, there'll be some, there'll be some growth. If you do farmer's walk with a heavy weight, there'll be some growth. But I think it's not worth, uh, to use a uh, Mike Isretel phrase, it doesn't, it doesn't have the best stimulus to fatigue ratio. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, because it seems like those two things are always put in the same section. Like you're training your grip and your forearms mm -hmm. at the same time. But it feels like there is some nuance there where, you know, you can specialize in grip training and that's mm -hmm. different than forearm hypertrophy. Yeah, and I find grip training in terms of just holding onto the bar, it's very connected to the upper back. I I sort of stumbled across this 20 years ago or so, um, but it seems to be the case that your grip isn't just a function of how strong your forearms are. I think there's some type of neural connection with your upper back. Because if you look at um, strong men, when they start to fail, like a, a hold, very often what will happen is the shoulders will start to hump, slump forward. And um, there's perhaps some sort of evolutionary thing where if something was so was tugging against you so much that you couldn't even hold on to it, you probably should let go. You know, maybe there's some type of evolutionary mechanism in our bodies to suggest it's not a good idea to hold on to something which is that strong. So I've always found grip strength just for holding on to a deadlift bar is a lot of that is quite related to the upper back strength as well, uh, rather than just grip strength. So again, it points to this maybe maybe reconsideration of what type of training you should be doing, you know, for, for what specific purpose. And who do you think should actually be doing forearm training? Cause I see a lot of beginners in the gym doing wrist curls. And yeah. my initial thinking is like, they should just do full bicep movements, like something like hammer curls is fine. It does both. But, um, do you think that's more for an intermediate or advanced lifter who's trying to build up that lagging part or like what's your your take on that you know i mean i think if somebody is um has the time and uh is motivated to do stuff like that yeah sure you know stick it in 
But um, I think if somebody is time restricted and they're looking to get the best bang for the buck, there's probably better things you could do. I mean, I never did any grip work. My forearms are pretty decent. Um, just slanging heavy weights generally grows everything. Heavy deadlifts, squats, even bench presses. So I wasn't a fan of doing huge a lot of direct work. I tend to think most people could probably do more exercise in general at the gym, which will translate to better overall growth. Um, possibly some advanced guys, but I also think some of this falls into the area of things that influencers say to differentiate themselves from other people in the industry as like the secret source. Um, so I'm not a massive fan of that type of stuff. I was a competitor. So um, I'm very much concerned with what works, not what gets me recognition on YouTube. And I tend to think some guys, not, not everyone, but you know, I think some guys are doing this type of stuff perhaps to sell their eBooks and things, you know? Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. The one that I is my go-to is so my gym has like a machine preacher curl. So I'll do the mm. standard preacher curl and then I'll do a few sets of reverse just at the end there mm. just to get some direct forum work. And it seems to work okay, but I'm not specializing on forums or anything like that. That makes sense. Have you seen some growth of that type of thing? I mean, I think so. Yeah. I, I, I would say I probably don't, uh, I don't do measurements as often as I probably should. Last mm -hmm. time I checked, I'm like, oh, I've seen some growth, but then there's also some body fat growth. So I, I find the best way to measure is when I'm at the same body fat. Um, that seems to give me the best measure of actual growth. So I'll, I'll do that when I'm probably a couple months from now when I cut. <laughs> yeah, I think tracking progress is real tricky. You know, like you say, measurements can be heavily influenced by body fat and uh, I think the best metric we've got is still strength. Personally, I keep going back to strength. Um, and my my whole goal with coaching is just to get people stronger for medium to high reps with good, good but not perfect, you know, good, repeatable, standardized form. Um, it's it's kind of my mantra. And I think that's the way, it's the most robust way to guarantee progress for most people. Yeah, if that's the case, then there's definitely progress. Like I'm still, I'm progressing in the gym. So I guess that's Sweet. what matters. Cool. Um, <clears throat> so one of my favorite intensity techniques and something you've mentioned before is useful is myo reps and myo mm -hmm. reps match. Can you explain what this is and how it should be implemented um, in a way that's appropriate for intermediate lifters? Yeah, so myo reps was invented by a guy called, I'm going to butcher his name, so I apologize, but um, Borga Figeli, I think. Just call him Blade. Yeah, so he used to be called Blade on Lyle's old forum, the, uh, the Monkey Island. Um, back in the day, the OGs will remember that one. Um, so yeah, he he's he's doing his thing now. He's he's really popular in the industry. But he invented this thing called my reps, which was essentially a take on rest pause, um, similar but not exactly related to the whole Dante Trudel type of rest pause, similar type of thing. You had one activation set, which was the first part of your set where Borg recommended doing about fifteen to twenty reps. Now the interesting thing with his approach was you didn't go to failure, so he wasn't really a big fan of that. His idea was you're trying to maximize the stimulus while minimizing the fatigue. That was his, his, he was a very early sort of adopter of that approach. And he thought going to failure was perhaps a little bit too much. So about 15, 20 good quality reps. I think he rested for about 20 to 30 seconds. Correct me if I'm wrong on that one. Uh, and then there were four more mini sets of approximately four reps each. And again, the difference with Borger was he specified four reps because again, he wasn't trying to go for failure. I think the idea was maybe if you do fail, drop the weight to ensure that your reps stay high. But in general, he was trying to get a good amount of high reps. He wasn't necessarily shooting for failure. Whereas on the other side of the coin, you had Dante Trudell, who was doing rest pulls with two additional sets, and they were to absolute failure. And hopefully again and again and possibly again. So yeah, that was that was my reps. Now, the my rep match, I want to credit Mike Isretel with this, or at least somebody in his crew. I first heard about it by watching his Instagram posts and I sort of looked around and I can't remember where exactly I got it from, but the idea generally is you you, you want to do at least two sets for my rep match because the first set is essentially your indicator set. Now, the second and subsequent sets, you will match the number of reps in your first set. So really, it probably shouldn't even be called my rep match. It's a completely separate thing. Um, so let's say I got 16 reps in my first set with no pauses, no breaks, just a continuous set. Then what I'm trying to do after a good amount of rest, two or three minutes, 
is I'm trying to replicate 16 reps. But because of the fatigue induced by the first set, I might not reach 16 at the first go. Let's say I get 12 or 13. So I'm missing a few reps. Then I would pause again for 20, 30 seconds and make up the reps. And as you do more and more my rep match, let's say onto your third set and fourth set, you're probably going to need more mini sets to make up the total number. So yeah, that, that's kind of a baron on what they are. Now, in terms of where to apply them, you know, I've gone back and forth on this, Varun. Um, so I was quite excited about this whole thing for a while. <laughs> I, I released a video on that, and I was doing that with clients and things. But in practice, I didn't find they worked particularly well. And I think, but firstly, in terms of what they're good for, I think they're quite good for adding extra volume, which is nice. Um, I think they can be potentially good for people who struggle with hitting failure. Um, but on the negative side, what I found was they were mostly a distraction um, because of this. For people who are going to be good at doing good hard sets, like guys who are late, intermediate, advanced, they're probably not going to need my reps or my rep match because they will get enough from a straight set that they'll be able to progress and go on to the next weight increment. Now, for guys who are beginners and early intermediates, the issue there is they might not be able to maintain the level of focus they need to be able to do justice to these. I've seen guys who have DM'd me on Instagram with, with a Myrep match, and it, it just looks like three very easy sets done back to back, which I don't think is really going to grow anyone. So it's sort of a conundrum. The people who need it, they're probably not going to execute it very well. The people who don't need it and can benefit just from straight sets it may well be too fatiguing for them. So I've got to say, Aaron, I don't really program them very much anymore. I think there's probably one exception for people for where it might be useful, which is just simply as a time-saving exercise. So yeah, I kind of changed my mind on those now. Yeah, so I implement it. I use it for uh, lateral raises, cable lateral mm -hmm. raises, specifically for that movement, because I find it's a good way for me to get a lot of volume in in a quick amount of time. Um, I do it slightly different, I would say, in that I do take the first set to failure um, or close to failure, let's say, mm -hmm. and then I do the match. Um, I take a couple minutes break between sets, but then when I'm doing the match, my breaks are probably like 10 seconds, five to 10 okay. seconds. But I do find there's a drop off. So if like, let's say that first set is 16, mm -hmm. uh, second one might be like 11, five, and then it might be uh, eight, four, four. But then if I'm doing another set, cause I'm trying to accumulate a lot, a lot of volume, it might be like five, three, 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 two, two. Yep. Um, mm -hmm. so I do find that if you're the type of person that's willing, that's able to push themselves, you can accumulate a lot of kind of useful reps for specific exercises. Cause when I've tried that with, uh, tricep extensions, yeah. um, like overhead, I haven't, uh, I haven't, I found straight sets work better. I guess this boils back to the question um, that I was going back to before is, how has this impacted your results? How has this impacted weight on the bar? Have you sort of had any type of comparisons between straight sets versus my rate match? Because that, that would, as a coach, that would be my my question. You know, what what is the bottom line here? What's the, our if our if our KPI is adding weight to the bar, like how does it affect the bottom line? Yeah, it's definitely added weight to the bar. And I think I've seen, uh, like measurable results, but it's hard to compare it with straight sets because mm -hmm. it's, you can't really compare two things at the same time. Right. So yeah. I feel like the results have been good and it's been a way for me to add a lot of volume, um, mm -hmm. in a, in a time constraint manner, as you kind of mentioned. Um, but I don't really have that good a B on how would that, how would it have been different if I had just done straight sets? Yeah. Um, but I just find it as a, a useful, uh, time saving and also just a way for me to push a lot of sets closer to failure. So I, I think I am doing it slightly different where I'm not really leaving too many reps in the tank. I think it's also quite mentally stimulating as well. You know, it can be a change of pace, be interesting, it can be fun. Um, I did it for uh, lying cuff laterals the other day and it's kind of fun. You get a good pump and uh, it feels good, it's different. But yeah, I think with regards to sort of clients, I, I like that. I like the fact that it can be a change of stimulus, it can be fun. I've got a few clients who really like to mix it up. 
But then because I'm always looking for the bottom line in terms of progress, particularly for my clients who are very competitive, um, I, I, I have to say I don't see a massive amount of difference in terms of, you know, for the type of person who's just willing to do the work, whatever it is, for the results, if it's straight sets, if it's my reps, whatever, I don't see there being a huge amount of practical difference in terms of the end point, you know, getting more weights on the bar, getting better results. So that's, again, it's probably why I've sort of moved away from it. just seems to add an unnecessary layer of complication. And if it's not helping you either mentally or um, time-wise, yeah. I don't like it. Yeah, that's it. Yeah. I feel like there's a trade-off, right? I think it's mm -hmm. valuable from a time-saving perspective, but it is mm -hmm. harder to measure progress, um, mm -hmm. I would say, uh, than yeah. straight sets. So the advantage- How do you measure your progress? Uh, so I, I would, uh, let's say I'm doing lateral raises. I have this machine. Um, so it might be like 60 times 16. That would be mm -hmm. like set one. And then set two would be like 16 times uh, 10.4.2 dot dot in my mm -hmm. spreadsheet. I use a spreadsheet for everything because I just like spreadsheets. So um, same, that's how way. I would measure it. And then next time, I, you know, I would try to get 17 on the first set. Right. So I would really push for the first set to increase the number. Mm -hmm. And then the the next mini set, I would get to 17, but I wouldn't really care how I got to 17. Yeah. So I don't have to get 12. It could be 11, 4, 3, 11, 4, 2, 1, however I do it. But I'm trying to progress on that first set until mm -hmm. I get to 20 or 25. And then I'll up the weight and, and do it again. I, I think that's probably the safest way to do it. That's the way I do it as well. Seems to be the least complicated. So yeah, I like that. Mm -hmm. Awesome. All right. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to throw out some quotes you've said in the past. Uh, just give me your first initial thought or take on it. All right. Most people say that they're 20% body fat when they're 35%. Most people are a lot fatter than they think they are. Yeah. Most people are a lot fatter than they think they are. Um, body fat gets everywhere. Um, yeah. I think, I think it's because, so there's two things here. First of all, in the, in the fitness industry, um, there is a general sentiment, not, I wouldn't say in our circles, but it, in the fitness industry as a whole, I think there's a general sentiment that 20% is this horrendous body fat, like it's just super fat. So there's a misconception there. And I think realistically speaking, most people who we speak to on a regular basis are not in that sphere. So when they hear 20%, they're horrified, but they're walking around at 20% and they're perfectly fine. 20% would be a reasonably lean person. In fact, I would say 20% would be, for the average person walking down the street, actually pretty lean, you know? Um, you'd have a nice thin face and you'd look pretty lean. So I think there's this disconnect between what we consider to be lean in fitness circles versus the average person. And so when the average person steps into our industry, they're almost immediately exposed to this like uh, dysmorphia that we have, <laughs> which is really not fair. So um, yeah. I think I think I do think that statement is true, but at the same time, I I probably follow that up with saying twenty percent is actually pretty lean. I mean, for me, twenty percent is a flat stomach. That's the way I normally think about it. So it's um, yeah, it's it's pretty lean. Yeah, I think so too. When I talk with friends and I tell them, like, I think I'm probably right now 18, 19 percent body fat, and mm. I'm much leaner than most people at my gym, and. Mm. Uh, that's just the reality. And there's nothing wrong with that. It's a good spot for me. If I get, you know, in the 22, 23 range, I don't feel as great. Mm -hmm. If I get below 14, I don't feel so great. So I just kind of hover in that 14 to 20% range. Yeah, I mean, I I mostly a, I, I mostly sit at about 20% year round. Um, but if I go to a beach and strip off I'm, and look around, I'm generally the best built guy there, you know, for you'd be very you'd be hard pressed not to be about that kind of range and not outdo 90 percent of the people on a regular holiday resort so yeah i think it's worth emphasizing that 20 percent is is a very good body fat for for most people year round for sure yeah and i'm sure you hear that as a coach right a lot of people they're you know they're probably starting at 35 and their goal is to get to 10 percent body fat it's like Maybe move that, maybe push that to 15 and 20 and see what life is like there. It might be more sustainable. Yeah, I did a video which which was quite popular about how I have managed long, lo large weight loss transformations. So um, particularly during lockdown, I was doing quite a lot of large weight loss transformations. So people had gained quite a lot of weight and 
the gyms weren't really open, so there wasn't a massive amount to do. So one of the strategies I did employ was maintenance periods as people went down. So if you've got a guy who wants to lose 75, 100 pounds, you've got to do it in stages. I find that maintenance periods, they're good for a couple of reasons. One, to help people understand what it means to eat at maintenance. I think a lot of people who go from never having dieted and being very heavy, say 250, 300 pounds, whatever, um, they only have two modes of eating, which is either diet or just free, go for it. And I think that has to be addressed. Um, I actually find maintenance phases to be challenging mm -hmm. compared to cutting. I'm one of those people. Because when you're cutting, you have that clear goal. You just want to get under that calorie target. A maintenance phase or just living normal life, that becomes a lot more challenging because you want to incorporate foods you enjoy um, into that life. And it's easy for it to get off track. Absolutely, yeah. I think the best situation is building your body up to the point where you're perhaps slightly over or at your settling point with a body composition you're happy with. So ultimately that's the goal to gain say 20, 30 pounds of muscle. And as long as you weren't like super overweight to begin with, most people can do that and live at a fairly reasonable body composition, eating foods they enjoy. Uh, that should be the goal, I think. For sure. All right, here's the next one. It's easy for old guys to say it was better in the past. Yeah, yeah. I think, yeah, I think maybe this is part of like my history as a school teacher. Um, I'm very pro the young generation, you know. I think a lot of the old guys, I think I just think they look back and they kind of forget, particularly when they're when they when they're no longer practicing. I mean, you see it with um, guys in the fitness industry who are no longer really in it and involved in it. All of a sudden. We almost without fail, it turns into a, we train harder back in our day, we suffered for our diets. And other, you know, I'm talking about pro bodybuilders, but I'm also talking about some influencers as well. Uh, if they're not actually in it and in the lifestyle, for whatever reason, I don't know what it is, they just immediately resort to this really seemingly um, bitter view on the world. And I, I don't want to call anyone out, but it's just kind of the way it feels sometimes that they get kind of bitter. And I don't know why that is. I can guess, I think perhaps if you've been somebody with a great physique, like for example, um, if you look at maybe Dorian Yates or Lee Priest or some of those guys or Chris Cormier, who recently made some comments about the, the, the newer generation, I think if you've been one of those guys who was at the absolute top of their field physically and on drugs, and then all of a sudden they're older, father time is caught up, they're no longer on the drugs, I think it must be a very difficult transition to return back to being a normal person. And I think perhaps that's their way of sort of reminding everyone who they are. I, I actually think they're, they're the older generation of bodybuilders, their comments on the younger generation is more a reflection of their general level of unhappiness in how, how, how they've aged. I just don't think they're handling age very well. Um, I'm, I'm conscious of that because well, I'm mid forties now and I, you know, I, I don't want to end up like that. So I don't want to be that old man shouting at the cloud. So I am conscious that I, I just think that's something that happens to people as they get older. But um, I think it's more reflection on their own mental health than it is on any sort of reality. And then you just get a lot of people who form an echo chamber and everyone sort of shots, starts getting angry and shouting about how things used to be better and things were better when, you know, men were men and, and women were afraid and all that kind of stuff. So, yeah. I <laughs> Yeah, I think it's just that the environment has changed, right? So I think there's been hardworking people, there's been lazy people throughout mm -hmm. history and time. I think human behavior has not changed too much. Yeah. I think the technology, social media, et cetera, landscape has changed. And you're just seeing that play out, you know, makes it perceived that people are more attention seeking or um, than they were in the past. They just didn't have that avenue to seek attention they had to do it in different ways you know that's really my yeah. point of view that you know i, I, I yeah. there's also I some, there's also some bias like sur survivor bias where mm. the people who made it out feel they forgot about everyone else they interacted with their whole life and so they're like we all worked hard it's like yeah you were a core group of people that worked hard and those core groups of people still exist you're just seeing a lot of other stuff on online yeah. Yeah, I, I can I can think of a few guys who I started lifting with back in the early 2000s who who were just as 
focused on all the wrong things and and we're distracted by a lot all, all the same things that some of the older guys might suggest that this generation is but um yeah i knew those guys back 25 years ago and they've still not made any progress so we had those kind of guys back then too as much as we have them now so i i, I completely agree with you on that way i don't think human nature fundamentally changes it's just the setting which is different yeah absolutely there are no mandatory lifts but there are people who get very upset <laughs> in the talk of skipping one yeah. so yeah. so there's this been ongoing thing on my channel um i made a video a couple of years ago now on overhead presses and all i was doing <laughs> in my defense i was just floating the idea that perhaps you need to think about how you program your overhead lifts in your in your routine because i think if you're I just think overhead pressing represents quite a large stress on the shoulder and the elbow joints within the context of a bodybuilding routine where you're trying to maximize volume. And if we're not taking that into account when we're programming other areas, which also affect the elbows and the shoulders, like the chest, then we can very quickly run into problems of overworking joints. And that's an issue. So like, for example, um, a very common setup that I see is people giving each muscle group a similar amount of volume. So let's say you do eight sets of chest per week, like pressing, and then eight sets of overhead pressing, and then eight sets of back work. Well, that's 16 sets of pressing and eight sets of back work. Now, I'm not, which which may well contribute to shoulder problems. Now, I'm not suggesting it has to be one-on-one -on -one because I think everyone's different and the different ratios, but I think we should at least start to pay attention to having some balance. And that's, all I was suggesting. Now, I, now I will say because I'm a, I'm a bit braver in my convictions. Now, I don't think the overhead press is necessarily a lift. I generally feel lateral work, you know, cables, dumbbells, machine work is probably better in the context of a hypertrophy program. And I think within five or ten years, everybody will agree with me. Um, but I won't get any credit because I'm a small YouTuber. But I, I think I think that's generally going to happen. So yeah, not, not a massive fan. I think you get bigger bang for your buck with flat and inclined pressing. Um, so yeah, that was that's kind of where that statement came from. Um, people just get very excited about things. And I'm not I'm not very emotionally attached to a lot of lifts. I'm more emotionally attached to progress. So I can cut a lift if it no longer serves me. But I think people kind of have their identities wrapped up in lifts or styles of training. Like power building is another one. Power building. Like, I never really heard it defined, you know, it's just a made up phrase, but people get very excited about it because it seems to represent their identity. And I think one of the reasons they get so excited about it is because it is so vague. It's vague, apparently it's cool, therefore we can attach ourselves to it. And people like to attach themselves to things which are cool, even though there's no real entry fee for being a power builder, like there is for being a power lifter or a bodybuilder or a competitive athlete of sorts, anybody can be a power builder so a lot of a lot of sort of very casual people tend to stamp that label on themselves and get very aggressive if you challenge it I think what's interesting there is you know you kind of mentioned people and their identity getting tied to specific lists i think that happens with uh specific areas as well right you'll have the person who loves powerlifting and their identity is tied to powerlifting and the lifts associated you even have people who are have tied their identity to certain YouTubers or influencers, and they have to do the style that that YouTuber is doing, whether it be evidence-based or experience-based or whatever it may be, they will, they've made it more than just trying to progress. They've tied a big piece of their identity to it, which I think is okay, but I think it can lead to less critical thinking and, and progress potentially long-term. Yeah, I mean, I, I can sympathize. I mean, I having trained for 25 years now and gone through a lot of changes myself, I can sympathize. Um, it can be difficult. So as I was approaching 40, I one of the I made the decision to downsize. So I've actually dropped quite a lot of weight and I wanted to be a bit smaller and walk around a bit smaller. Generally speaking, um, I didn't want to be 220 pounds walking around in my 50s and 60s. So I, I don't think that's associated with a lot of longevity. So I did downsize, then lockdown happened and gym access was sporadic. So I lost some muscle as well. And coming out of that period, um, it is quite difficult. You know, it's quite difficult to deal with people's reactions when you're 
smaller than there used to be. Um, there used to you being. So you almost have to rejig your your own identity. So I think it can be difficult. So I do, I can relate to people when they struggle to shake off um, identities which are no longer serving them. Because I found it difficult. I found it difficult to shake off that identity of being, you know, big fast because that didn't really serve me anymore. Um, so yeah, it can be tough. Uh, I don't, I don't think it's healthy because ultimately, if it's not serving you, you should be able to get rid of it uh, without having a lot of emotional trauma. That is the whole, you know, Buddhist thing, isn't it? Um, but uh, yeah, it's, I, I, it must be tough. Yeah, I think people just need to ask themselves this one question: like, is my approach moving me closer towards my goals at the pace i want and if the answer is yes after thinking about it great if the answer is no reassess what you're doing change the approach and strategy and go for it right like i think a lot of people don't ask that question i mean that's another good point isn't it it's like i'm not sure a lot of people are very clear about what their goals are you know a lot of people like um alex leonidas um great guy talked to him a lot and um he mentioned in one of his videos the whole his whole powerlifting arc was a little bit misguided because all he really wanted to do was be jacked, and um, he I don't think he regretted it because I think he did great with the strength and fantastic. But he said his main goal was actually just building a good physique. I hope I'm not terribly misquoting him here, but I'm pretty sure he said that. <laughs> but um, anyway, I think for a lot of people, there probably is a bit of that. They go for strength in the hopes that they will look like their favorite strength athlete who is jacked and lean and strong. But in reality, they really just want to be lean and look good on the beach. I think in that instance, there's almost this moral, um, it's almost morally wrong just to train for aesthetics. Um, I don't know where that comes from. But uh, I think for some people, they almost have to feel like they're training for strength or something else, just other than just aesthetics. That certainly was the case when I was sort of training here in the early 2000s. Um, you had to be something other than just a bodybuilder like it was all about the hit training like if you're training you got to train hard because you're a working man and all that kind of stuff um so yeah i think people need to be honest with what they actually want from training as well i would agree with that 100 percent. i think that's in all aspects of life it's like training for aesthetics is fine like uh, i know a lot of people who are you know serious about lifting will be like I only wear gym gear and I have a big beard and yeah. I don't take care of my hair. Like I get haircuts all the time. I shave. I don't always wear gym gear. So figure out what works for you and what makes sense and just go for that. And it's okay if you're influenced by certain people. We're all influenced by certain people, but like mm. you got to know what you want. Yeah. It's quite amusing over here in the UK. You can almost tell just by a two minute conversation with somebody how far they are down the Jordan Peters sort of rabbit hole, you know, the train by JP, because they have the gear, they have the t-shirts, they have the jugs, um, they have the, they say all the same phrases, you know, like better, uh, don't miss all that kind of stuff. You can, <laughs> it's really easy to tell. <laughs> I find that quite amusing. Yeah. yeah. All right. Uh, so I'm going to move over to nutrition because I think it's really important. We always talk about training. So you mentioned that you were a fat kid growing up, being over 200 pounds at 15, and you initially tried to lose weight with cardio. So something I find interesting is how you modulate appetite through food choices and set up your diet for maximum satiety. Can you explain this in as much detail as possible? Yeah. So what, what I teach to, to my clients is um, to look at the different macros on a continuum, uh, more satiating versus less satiating. Nothing is off limits, really. It's just a case of what you need at the time. So if we're looking at um, carbohydrate sources, which is probably the, the best example, along the more satiating examples, you've got your vegetables and potatoes and things like that, and less satiating, which can be useful if you are looking to bulk, you don't have a particularly great appetite, or let's say you just peak bulk and you've got a lot of calories to get in, you've got things like rice, pasta, and perhaps even some special tricks like um, dextrose on the rice or things like that. You know, all the really the trips that we we employ at the end of a bulk. So I like to view things on a continuum, and that way you're just picking the the right tool for the job essentially. And you can do that for protein sources as well, going from leaner options to fattier options, and and all the rest of it. So I I the, the key tenant is you don't want to go hungry. In this way, I think I'm quite similar to what Mena Hensman 
uh, recommends as well. And um, his idea being, you don't want to go hungry. You just want to change the food options. So at the end of a diet, you may well just be on lean chicken breast, lean white fish, green beans, and not much else. But at least you're eating plenty of those so you can have your fill. Peak bulk, on the other hand, you may well be having fattier sources of meat, much more rice, much more pasta. I mean, a lot of pro bodybuilders will say bodybuilding is essentially just a game of who can eat the most meat and rice. And that's a case of just pushing your size up because it's the most palatable way of doing that. So that's kind of the way I do it. Um, nowadays, at the size of my now, I'm about 90 kilos now, it's about half and half. So half the day will be leaner options, other half the day will be more more calorie dense options. And that's a good balance for me to keep me at a reasonable shape with enough energy to train where I am. So I think this is a way where even if you're on the smaller side, you can still eat a fulfilling diet and not be super hungry all the time while just modulating your food choices. Yeah, I always focus on satiety earlier in the day. I just mm. find it's easier. I have my food kind of prepped and uh, my willpower at that point is better, if that makes sense. Like, And then as the day kind of goes, my I start having more caloric dense food and it mm. seems to work most of the time. Um, so I feel like everyone needs to figure out what that balances and i think you said this where you said you know you're either you can go to sleep full by eating satiating food or you can eat the food you like and then you're going to bed hungry potentially if you're dieting or you're not losing any weight so like it's a trade-off it's one of those three that you're kind of picking if you're in the dieting phase yeah so when i was starting to get into uh, nutrition probably about 10 years ago when i was really starting to take it seriously after i retired from powerlifting um, a lot of the education around there was to do with a more of an if you picture macros, flexible approach. And um, that was my initial education. The, the problem with that approach is it can leave you very hungry. So just for the sake of being flexible, um, it can lead you to just to additional feelings of hunger. And it was, it was quite an issue because I think a lot of the people who were promoting that method of eating, certainly the people that I was interacting with, came from a more of a disordered eating background where they were being overly restricted. So their default when they were trying to escape from that was to be highly flexible. And that's what they taught people as the superior approach for mental health. When in actuality, for a guy like me, who's never had binging problems at all, and is actually more of a just overall, just a bigger guy, it was much more on me to provide more dietary discipline. So I think this is where there's kind of two camps who fight each other. It's like the overly restrictive camp well, not overly restrictive, but the restrictive camp where I'm probably, I personally sit more in, into and the more flexible camp, they both have the pros and cons. And I think it really is a case of what suits your personality and what your history is. Like just broadly speaking, for people who have come from perhaps very restrictive eating backgrounds, if not fully disordered, they tend to do better with flexible approaches moving forward, like macro accounting approaches. So they have flexibility to eat what they want, when they want. Now for others like myself, who come from more free eating backgrounds where I actually need discipline, we tend to do better with um, meal plan approaches with being a little bit stricter and having more discipline. Because if I was left to my own devices, I would be quite literally like a fat kid in a candy shop. You know, there would be no stopping me. So <laughs> I'd quite easily be back to that 220 pounds. So I think that that's generally what I've observed anyway. So when I coach people, I try and get a feel for where they sit via their diet history and direct them towards a particular approach which may jive with what they need. Yeah, I think, uh, you know, that's really interesting, kind of the flexible side compared to the more restrictive side. Mm -hmm. I find that uh, having some flexibility can be mentally good for people trying to lose weight, especially kind of gen pop. But then it can very quickly turn into not eating any satiating foods and then being hungry. So it's kind of figuring out what that balance is for you. Uh, every day after lunch with my coffee, I have two uh, fun size chocolate bars like Kit Kat. Nice. That's kind mm -hmm. of my little sweet treat. I drink black coffee. Mm -hmm. So I just kind of fit in a couple of things, but like my actual meals for the most part, unless I'm eating out or things like that are, are pretty solid. But I fit in those little treats to kind of keep my sanity going. I think that's a great way to go. I actually did it for my contest prep in 2018. Pretty much for every night, except for the last three weeks, I had a, a little fun-sized chocolate bar. 
It's great. <laughs> Just fit it into my meals. Great. Yeah, the reason I had I, I started that is when I worked at Google, you get free food. And uh, I think the thing is within like 30 steps of you, there's always like a, a full food area stocked with drinks and food and stuff. Mm -hmm. So they have like fruit and they have junk food and stuff. And they had every type of like fun size chocolate. So I would just grab two of those and go back to my desk. And then have I, I, I would be a disaster in that place to tell you. <laughs> yeah, there was this one guy who for breakfast, we had a, a French patisserie in our specific building. And uh, I'd get like steak and ahi tuna salads. This nice. one guy was having like 13 chocolate croissants for breakfast. And I remember in my mind, I was like, this guy's at like 3,500 calories. It's 8.30 in the morning. It's, it's not great, right? Free food. What a legend. Brilliant. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, so you've mentioned you've had lagging side delts and biceps mm -hmm. after your powerlifting career. So in that context, what's your Mount Rushmore? The top four isolation exercise for someone who wants a great physique, but has come from a powerlifting background. Mm. Yeah, I would definitely focus on the side delts and the the biceps if you did what I did and ended up lagging. Um, I still really like regular dumbbell laterals. I think they're very good. Um, that's certainly what I did a lot of when I was – I spent a year specializing on my delts and biceps. So for that year, I held pretty much everything else constant in terms of volume, and I really ramped up volume on the side delts and biceps. I was doing – I was training those four days a week while bulking as well. So I was doing a lot of dumbbell laterals and also a lot of cable cable work. Wasn't a huge fan of machines. I yet to find a machine for the side laterals that managed to fit the path that I want. So cables are very flexible. I'm doing one at the moment, which is quite nice, which is lying cuff laterals. They're pretty good. Um, so I would say those two, just regular dumbbell laterals, the tension is sort of more at the top, not as much at the bottom, which I think is probably a good thing. Um, I'm not sure at the bottom there's as much side delt as there is perhaps some of the areas of the back, but certainly at the top there's a lot. Um, and cable cuff laterals are pretty good. Now for biceps, I like the um, the sort of the, the cable curl where your elbows are slightly behind your back. I think Menno calls it a Bayesian curl. He's tried to sort of so are you, um, you cut out. Can you start again at biceps? Biceps, yeah. So, yeah, I like um, a cable curl where your elbows are slightly behind your back. So Menno calls it a Bayesian curl. I think he's trying to put his kind of stamp on that. Yeah. Um, I love that. I, I've, I've always loved that. That's been a great exercise. Uh, that's pretty good. But apart from that, just something heavy. So I quite like just heavy dumbbell curls. I think as heavy as you can go on those. I've seen a lot of growth from regular dumbbell curls with a bit of a twist, but also a bit of swing. So very strict cable curls matched with very heavy dumbbell curls seems to have done quite well so yeah i think those would be my four exercises which i would say two for delts two for buys so you feel like the side delts and the biceps are the two main lacking areas does anything else stick out or it's really those two that you feel are not being done i mean i think those certainly for me i think nowadays level of education and powerlifting is better you know i think people are having more balanced routines so ideally they shouldn't leave powerlifting with quite as many imbalances as I did. I was much more high frequent powerlifting. Um, so I, I kind of spent the majority of my energy just doing squat bench and deadlifts and variations. But yeah, I, I'd say I'd say for for the average person, I suppose I'd have to have a look at their physique, but certainly for me, that was the case. You know, um, perhaps calves, but everybody wants calves, you know. Um, but yeah, I think, I, I'm not sure you can ever have two big side delts or, or biceps So Yeah, I agree. <laughs> Um, so watching your channels, uh, there was an exercise that you talked about, which I found interesting. I haven't done it. And it was called the Kelso shrug. Can mm -hmm. you explain that? Because I thought that was pretty neat. And maybe what's the application of it? Yeah, so I, I talked about that a few years ago. It seems to have blown up now. A lot of people are talking about it. Um, and it's I want to bring it to light because it's a program. It's a routine I've always had. It's an exercise I've always had in my programs. And it was invented and popularized by a guy called Paul Kelso. So from what I recall, Paul Kelso was an American who was out there living in Japan. And I think he was part of the, the press team over there. So he was doing powerlifting interviews and things like that from, from what I can remember. But he wrote a series of books, 
one of which was a book just on generally on powerlifting, which is a really good book. And it was written in a sort of conversational style, a bit like uh, Keys to Progress by John McCallum, if you have heard of that book, yeah. So it's kind of telling stories. So that was his powerlifting book. But he also wrote a book specifically on different types of shrugs, uh, which was great. All different types of shrugs, shrugs going forward, backward, upward, downward. Um, apparently, he <laughs> apparently he wanted to name one of his shrugs after Casey Butt, um, but but he refused <laughs> as for obvious reasons. <laughs> that was the that was the joke anyway. But yeah, so anyway, Kelso shrug I think was the most useful variation because it was shrugging the shoulders directly backwards. Now. What I find is with rows and, and pull downs, you're almost always going to be limited by, by the power of your um, biceps in, in the movement, even, even if you're very good at isolating your lats. So with the cable Kelso or the any kind of Kelso shrug, it's a pure back exercise. If you're proficient at doing it, you should be able to handle more weight on the Kelso shrug than on any of the back exercise. So what I find is that area has a lot of potential. To begin with, you're probably not going to be able to handle anywhere near as much weight, but that signifies you're quite weak in the area. And a lot of people are, because I don't think a lot of people really complete the rep when they're doing a row or a pull down, like shrug the shoulders all the way back. I mean, I don't necessarily think you have to either, but it shows that there is untapped potential in the mid back. Now my mid back's pretty thick. And I think I got a lot of that from Kelso shrugs over the years. So it's very good for that mid back region filling in the middle traps, which looks very, makes your back look very thick and wide on stage and also makes your traps look very prominent from the front though. So, yeah, and, and the poundage potential is huge. So it has a big carry over to your rows and your pull downs as well. So yeah, big exercise. I think it's a bit of a gem um, mm, for sure. Yeah, I'm gonna give it a go. And do you have a specific uh, like uh, rep range that you'd like to work in for that exercise? I think, yeah, mostly fairly high reps because it's quite a short range of motion. Uh, like any kind of shrug, you probably don't want to shrug for for low reps. I don't feel you get much out of it. But if you're if you're going to about eight to twelve range, and my preferred setup is on a cable row machine, um, as long as your lower back can handle it, that's I think the where you're not going to be restricted by the movement you need in your in your thoracic back, because you need to have some free movement of your shoulders going back and forward. I think if you're trying to do it on a chest supported row unless you're just reported on your stomach, you're probably going to have difficulty in really shrugging your shoulders back and forth, which you need to do. The uh, The key to the exercise is really getting the scapula to move forward and back under load. So you have to have free movement in your thoracic region. Awesome. That's great. I'm going to give that a go next week. Yeah, when I was doing research, I saw that. I was like, this is interesting. I'm always trying to work on traps, and I mostly do shrugs. So like, yeah. this seems like a nice way. And I'm already on the cable machine anyways for yeah. back so just make a little change there all right so what i'm gonna do is i'm gonna yeah you can do it in a couple of different ways you can do it either as an extension of your cable row or as a complete separate exercise yeah all right i'm gonna throw some images on the screen here so for the first one here it's a book uh tell me what you learned from the book broad so this was um this was sort of a lot of my entry into lifting, this and the guys at the gym who were promoting high intensity training. Um, I guess what I learned from the, this was the importance of progressive overload for medium to high reps in good form. That mantra, which was at the heart of this book, was superb because it cuts through a lot of the, the BS. Even today, I think that message is very relevant. So yeah, I think a very good book. I, I think if more people started off training with this, they would probably have their first year's more similar to mine. Awesome. All right. So for the next few, I'm going to put someone on the screen. Tell me something you learned from them and then what workout you would do with them if you met them in person. Steve Shaw. Um, <laughs> so with Steve, uh, I think with Steve, Steve really emphasizes the importance of the basics, you know, um, which is good. Again, similar to the previous book, I think it's important to keep your focus on the basics. I think if we were training together, I would probably put him through a deadlift workout and uh, because I think we both like our deadlifts. I think that'd be fun. Yeah. Awesome. Dorian Yates. Uh, yeah, the man. I, I mean, I think the main thing I learned from him, as did all of us back in the day, was intensity. You know, intensity is super important. It was, it was almost to the point where the intensity was more of a focus than the added weight on the bar. It was how hard you worked. 
And this was kind of similar to tied up to what we were talking about before about identity. A lot of guys back then, their identity was in how hard they worked rather than what they looked like on stage or what they looked like at the gym or whatever. It was just in the hard work. It was sort of prizing hard work over aesthetics almost. And it, it made it made body because a lot of these guys, you got to remember back in the early 2000s around this area in the, early, in the late 90s were working men. You know, they had physical jobs. And so doing bodybuilding back then, it wasn't really seen as something those guys should have been doing, you know, oiling yourself up and prancing around on stage. But the fact that they could tie themselves up in this identity of hard work meant that bodybuilding was acceptable. So what I learned from him was intensity. And if we were to do a workout together, it'd be a back workout for sure. For sure. Back workout. Yeah. And is it true that you were a little bit of a, a Dorian Yates uh, hater early on because uh, he was from the UK and you didn't want to join the kind of mainstream crowd? Yeah, you know, I rebelled a little bit. So initially, my initial first couple of years were all about Dorian, hits and also Braun. But yeah, I rebelled because at a certain point, I hit a wall, you know? Now, uh, when I hit the wall, I went to the Braun guys and they all told me, look, you've hit your limit. You're done. You've hit your genetic ceiling. You've got a 200 pound bench. You're done. Congratulations. You know, and I didn't want to believe that. And when I talked to the Dorian guys, the guys at the gym, the old guys at the gym, they, they said to me, look, you just got to train harder. So I was stuck between a rock and a hard place because I felt I was training as hard as I could. And I felt I wasn't at my limit. So the solution for me was to look elsewhere. And I added more volume. And like, like you do when you're younger, <laughs> you tend to you tend to rebel and dislike things which you feel aren't right for you. Like as an adult now, I don't hate those hit guys or or the brawn guys, you know, but when you're young, you don't necessarily know how to deal with things. And I was uh, much more emotional about it back then. So I kind of rebelled from the hit guys. Whereas now, no, I think he's fantastic. And uh, I love it. I love it all. So, yeah. All right. Next one. Serge new bread. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I did a video about him, which was, because I, I, I think his physique is tremendous. I think in terms of the, the best thing I've learned about him was just um, to place a good emphasis on being lean year round and also for for life. Because Serge was in great shape right up until the point he died. And apparently, this is public knowledge now, so I don't think I'm saying anything um, out of turn, but apparently the circumstances of his death were slightly suspicious, slightly. Mm. Um, so it's not like he died you know, suddenly from, you know, steroid related issues, um, he was going really strong right until he died. So I think the value of being in shape, working a lot, working out a lot uh, and eating good foods right up until you're, you're old is something that I want to mimic myself. Awesome. All right. Next one, bald Omnium in Paris. <laughs> My, yes. I'd say with, with Paris, Paris has been firstly, just a, just a big up to Paris. Paris has been probably, my most consistent um, and positive supporter since I've been on YouTube. Uh, he was one of the first guys on my channel when I was an absolute nobody, and he still drops comments and likes and everything. We talk every now and again on Instagram as well. Like super, super stand-up guy, uh, jacked as hell. Um, in terms of what I learned from him, um, oh, you know what? You know what I have learned from him? I've learned to like um, the whole anime type of thing. Because I was okay. not in, it's not, it's not my generation, you see. So um, I was into the whole He-Man, you know, Thunder, Thundercats, all that kind of stuff. So all of that came afterwards. But because of him, I've started to look into that stuff a bit more. And uh, I've started to use that more, the artwork more in my thumbnails and uh, watch some of the shows. And I actually quite enjoy it. It's, it's, it's fun. All right. But anyway, super cool guy. Love him. Love him to bits. What, what would you train with him? What I train with him? Ah, I think we train bench. We would we would get we would get a sick chest pump and we would pose <laughs> just like that, yeah. And I think he'd agree with that. <laughs> All right, last one here. Uh, what have you learned <laughs> from from World of Warcraft, and what <laughs> what racer class would you train with? <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. Um, you know, for a long time I actually quit because I was trying to get all serious about my work, and I thought, you know, adults don't play games, you know. So, um, but actually, it was probably about five years ago. My wife said, "Look, why don't you?" start again because you know you're very you're very busy with work and you need an outlet so i thought okay cool so um i did and i think i think what it taught me was the value of downtime because when you're young when you're really young i think everything's downtime 
then as you get older into your, certainly for me, into my late 20s, certainly 30s, it's almost like you work too much. And it's like, I need to be an adult now. I need to do adult things. But now at my age, in my 40s, I'm like, no, no. Adult things are great because they put food on the table, but you really need to learn to relax. So yeah, what I learned was the ability to relax. What I would train, I think I would train, I would train sh a strongman session with an orc warrior. <laughs> yeah, that's like, uh, yeah, that's, he's going to get world records right there as, as an orc. Um, and I think it's important, the downtime too, right? Like sometimes it's fun having something that's like, stupid that you're super into right. and that you can exactly. nerd out about yeah. like i have my stuff like i play like fantasy sports i play some games mm -hmm. I, I play strategy D D type stuff and it's great to just take it super seriously when it's not serious you know because <laughs> it it makes you forget about like the actual serious stuff happening in life i totally agree this is that's exactly how i describe it it's just it's stupid you know it's stupid it's stupid right. video games they mean nothing but that's the point they're supposed to be stupid. They're supposed to mean nothing. And it, to be fair, it's even a bit like that with training as well. I mean, I think it's cr I think it's crazy that people can go through their lives without experiencing the joy of a good training session. I think that's mad. You know, I've had that for 25 years. I think no matter what happens today, I've done my session. I've done my training. I had a great session this morning. I hit a PR, which is awesome. Right? Still excited about that. It was a big one. And, and I've done my cardio. I feel great. So people go through their lives without experiencing that. And and just to take it onto a serious note for a second, I know a lot of guys my age, that sort of mid forties range, who aren't doing so well mentally because they don't have something like that. And I just think to myself, they would do so much better if they're not resorting to alcohol or other kinds of you know shenanigans. Um, if they just pour themselves into something which they can do without anyone else, they can just walk into the gym on their own and feel good about themselves, get that win for the day, and just go about the day with a smile on their face. I think that's great. Like I, on a daily basis, I can go hit a PR at the gym, do my cardio. I can feel great about myself. I can play some Warcraft, you know, um, do whatever, right? And, um, you know, it's just nice to have those wins. And I think it's nice to have those wins. One of my one of my first coaches was a guy called Janelle Singh. Like, rest in peace. He's, he's dead now. And I remember I remember this. One time we were training, and he pushed me, he pulled me to one side, and he said, Faz, do you take any protein powder? I was like, yeah, I just get some cheap stuff from the internet. And he says, he says, good, because look, in your life, he was talking to me, he was saying this, he says, in your life, bear in mind, I was like 20 years old at this time. He says, in your life, you're going to have, you're always going to have your family, you're always going to have work, but you need something for yourself. Never skimp on your hobbies. And I always remember that. It was such a nice thing for him to say. This guy was 50 year old when I was, when I was being coached by him and I was just a kid. But I always remember that. And it's so true. Such a great thing. So I'm perfectly justified in all my little stupid things that I do because they keep me happy. It's literally why I am doing this podcast. Right. Yes. I'm not there a you go. It's just for yeah. fun. It's just a yeah. hobby. It's fun. It's nice chatting with people. And it's you get to keep the mind active in ways that there's no stress associated with it. Yeah, that's the thing. Yeah. That's that's what it's about. It is fun. It's good to do just fun, silly things. Absolutely. Life's too right, serious. Now, all right, I'm going to end today with the hardest question you've ever been asked. What is the better show, Simpsons or Family Guy, and why? Oh, good Lord. I'm going to have to go Simpsons, old school. Um, more longevity. Richer characters. Apparently more accurate on world events, weirdly enough. Yeah. Um, strange, isn't it? Um, I do love Family Guy, but sometimes... I it the, the humor is a little bit vulgar for me. It's a bit sickly, physically okay. physically vulgar. I'm not I'm not a fan of the the body stuff, uh, like the throwing up and everything. Oh, yeah, 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 all that stuff. So Simpsons for me, and it has more longevity. But that's a good question. That made me think. Yeah, yeah. I feel like uh, Simpsons yeah, has the deeper characters. Like Homer is a deeper character than Peter. But like I think I've laughed uncontrollably more during family guy where i couldn't stop laughing so i feel I like simpson's smarter but family guy just has some scenes where i've just at least when i was younger I, I would just die i'd have to like watch it on repeat but yeah both classics how does american dad fit into that um i like roger quite a bit <laughs> Roger's and, great. Uh, i think steve is underrated as a cheesy nerdy character i like i like american dad i've watched 
I don't know if I've seen every episode. I've seen a good portion of them. Um, yeah, it's a good show. But I think similar to you, I never really got into anime, but I got into those type of cartoon shows. I grew up on like X-Men and things like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But the, but the new anime stuff, like I know a lot of the people in the fitness space, they love it. Mm. And even uh, Dragon Ball, like I, I watched some of it, but I was never like super hardcore into it. Mm -hmm. I was more... I used to watch TV for um, for comedy, and I think uh, on the on the more like bodybuilding side or whatever. Like I watched I watched uh, wrestling a lot, like WWE, yeah. WWE. So that was kind of my. That's how I was like, hey, I want to be jacked. It was more like Hulk Hogan and The Rock as opposed to Goku, which is fine. The Rock and Stone Cold era was amazing. Yeah, it's one of the greatest things ever. Really I can't remember which which WrestleMania it was. Do you remember that one where it was? The Limp Biscuit music, and it was Rock and Stone Cold. So they did. That was, they did, I would they say, did two WrestleManias together, from what I remember, but I don't remember the Limp Biscuit. Was it Limp Biscuit or? It might be Limp Biscuit. That's it. Yeah. yeah. There's there's one with a really famous soundtrack, but that I think was peak peak wrestling for me. Yeah, and when WCW was going big too, it was all kind of happening at the same time. Yeah, it was good times. Booker, Booker <laughs> T is a comedy genius. Yeah. yeah. All right, Faz, thanks so much for your time. Where can everyone find you? Uh, mostly on YouTube these days. Just look on the Faz lifts. Um, but yeah, thank you so much, Farron, for having me on. Just wanted to just thank you for that. And um, really enjoyed talking to you. And um, thank you so much for the invites. I appreciate it. Awesome. Take care.